Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, warm welcome to you all here, if not wet, welcome uh, to St. Luke's Anglican this morning. We're glad that you're here with us, and I'm grateful. Uh, this week has been very exciting. A lot of hustle and bustle has been going on uh, for our uh, ministry fair, which is taking place right after this service. So don't just run off. Come with us in the Crons Fellowship Hall, and you'll see all of the um, various opportunities that we have uh, for you to get involved in the life of our church here. And if you're visiting, that's great. You can come and just check it out. You, know, you may want to stick around. So, um, so please uh, join us for this. It's been, a, it's been, a, been an exciting week. Um, we have some, have some sort of a point of personal privilege to share with you a praise report um, that some of you know. Um, our youngest son, Bradford, was born um, about a year ago, October 15th, with a heart condition that has... Um, required him to be on uh, two medications uh, thus far his entire life. So we have a bunch of um, sort of uh, alarms set throughout the house and various things. And so I went to up to MUSC, um, the little, the Okatee uh, uh, sort of outpost, you know, it's halfway to the Kazoo Museum, you know, that place. Um, <laughs> I just thought that was funny. But at any rate, there is a Kazoo Museum almost halfway there. But anyway, um, but I went there and you'll be happy to know he has been taken down from one of his medications. And the doctor is expecting expectant and hopeful that we will um, uh, be able to wean him entirely off by the turn of the year. And so um, I, I was just a, it was a wonderful, it sort of I drove home with, with an elated heart and a, and a lightened, happy smile. And over this past year, you know, I've spent some time with these doctors, and I've gotten to know them, and I have a deep affinity for, for anyone in the medical profession, but particularly these, these pediatricians um, who deal with sort of the, the hardest and the roughest cases. You know, there's a real, a real deep affection I have for them. And in fact, I was even tearing up as I was talking to them how grateful I've been um, for the way that they have treated um, uh, Bradford, of course, but also um, held our hands through this entire process. Because as anyone knows, in any medical um, experience, but particularly with children, um, to, be, to be sort of understood and held and guided and comforted in the midst of that is no small thing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And I said as much to them, and I'm tearing up as I was, even now as I'm thinking about it. I mean, I'm reminded when I was with him, as some of you know, on Christmas Eve this past year down at Savannah Children's Hospital, and I was just struck by the the gifts that they gave us, which, which by and large have been called and accumulated from other Christian churches and little beanies and like a little Christmas tree and an angel and all these little gifts that have been given specifically so that when children find themselves in these situations over holidays, they're comforted and cared for. And it was just so touching. And so I'm, I'm carrying all of that. I mean, I know Bradford won't remember the little, um, the little uh, candy cane striped beanie, you know, that, that he went home in but we got a lot of pictures, I can assure you. And so I was carrying all this um, as I'm sort of driving back on Friday. And, and I was reminded, you know, I, I, I make it a habit, if possible, to go into the chapels whenever I go to a hospital. You know, I find it, you know, sort of professionally interesting. Um, and, and I go into these chapels and I fix them up if they're in any disarray. You know, I do my best to sort of like put the, you know, stack the Bibles and put the little tracks, you know, there. And I, I, I have perhaps removed some, some non-Christian things from there if, um, if, if necessary. Um, but I, um, but I, I always set the Bible at least to Psalm 23 or to Romans chapter 8, because you never know what people know about the Bible or what they're going to see when they go in there. And so at least they'll maybe just read, start reading those two sort of perennially comforting sections of the Bible. And so having been a parent there and praying in there myself, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to all of the reasons why people would find themselves in a hospital chapel, and particularly at a pediatric hospital. I mean, we all know that, um, that prayers for healing, this side of heaven, um, a clean bill of health today is temporary. We all know that. And yet, when we find ourselves in these chapels, in these places under duress, well, I, I wonder. I mean, I know what I pray, but I also pray for the people that will come through those doors and find themselves in that situation. And I pray for them, and I wonder, what are they praying about? To whom are they praying? 
Is this the first time, perhaps, they've ever deigned to darken the door of a, of a church or a chapel? Is it, is it a regular occurrence for them? Do they pray all the time? I mean, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time now in my life in, in hospital chapels. I try to go to the airport chapels, wherever I can find them, because I'm intrigued. And more than that, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that in the midst of the anxiety, suffering, and pain, and loss that is often accompanied by visits not only to hospitals, but perhaps even airports, that in the middle of that, the Lord would open these people's eyes to see Him, that He would intervene and cause their deaf ears to be unstopped and their eyes to be opened to who He is and what He has done to save. So I pray, when I go in, I pray for, obviously, the concerns that I have in my own life, but then by extension, the families that are represented by the people in these hospitals. I, I pray in the same way that I pray for, for you all, that we, that we all pray for the church, for everyone that comes through these doors. We pray that what we are asking for is nothing short of a miracle, for the gift of faith to be bestowed, for the dead in unbelief, as Paul says, to be raised to the new life of faith. And we implore and intercede and, and, and ask with fervency that the Lord would show His mighty hand to save. About this time last year, some of you remember, uh, Father Kelly uh, drew our attention to a prayer in the back of the prayer book, which, um, which I commend to you, prayer number 64, entitled, A Prayer for the Unrepentant. And I've returned to this prayer time and time again over the past year, and it goes like this. Merciful God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they should turn to you and live. And through, only, and through your only Son, you have revealed yourself as the God who pardons iniquity. Have mercy on the unrepentant and those who do not believe, especially, insert your name or in the name of someone you know there, especially awaken in them by your word and Holy Spirit a deep sense of their sinfulness and peril. Take from them all ignorance, hardness of heart, and contempt of your word. Grant them to know and feel that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which they must be saved, but only the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and bring them home and number them among your children, that they may be yours forever. Well, as some of you remember, we sent a bookmark home, and we'll do it again this year with you during our sort of stewardship campaign, that had that prayer on one side, that commended to your use, and on the other side we had prayer number 12, which we'll hear at the end of our prayers of the people, called For the Local Congregation, and in this way, these two prayers sort of combine to, to acknowledge that we recognize that our only hope, our only solution for um, salvation is for the Holy Spirit to intervene in the lives of those whom we love, and that He would do that through the work of this church, that you and I would be strengthened in our own faith, and thus more likely to confess about what Jesus has done for you when spoken to about it uh, by those who are currently in unbelief. That is the hope. That is the expectation, and that is our, our, our deep desire for the work of the church here at St. Luke's. I mean, this is what it is summed up to be. We're in, as it were, the deliverance business. You know, we, we deliver people. We watch the Lord deliver people from darkness to light, from unbelief to faith, from despair to hope, from all of the things that come from being awakened, having your ears open and eyes clearly to behold our risen Lord. I mean, take the promise from the Old Testament, which we heard read today, of what the messianic kingdom would be like, and we see where Isaiah writes that, that Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come to you, come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. You see, these people in our gospel reading today, Mark's account, would have been aware of this promised messianic prophecy and say they rightly understood when they saw Jesus open the deaf uh, ears and they, the mute speak, he says, they say he has done all things well. He has even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak just as promised. Now the difficulty, of course, as we know, for those watching Jesus is that 
their expectation of the coming kingdom, their expectation of the messianic rule of life with the Messiah, didn't factor in a cross. We know this. We know that the people who were following Jesus had not factored in the reality of suffering and death. It had not factored in the wages of sin. You see, from the earliest accounts that we have, the preaching of the gospel has evoked contempt and scorn from unbelievers at precisely this point, at the point of suffering, at the point of pain, at the point of the cross. And yet, for those who saw both then and now, who see in the cross of Christ the just deserts of their sin, and find then in the empty tomb by the power of the Spirit victory of Jesus by Jesus on their behalf, well, then their ears are unstopped to the goodness of God's Word. Their eyes are opened to the glory of His creation, and nothing for them will ever be the same. It happened then, it happens now, and by God's grace, through our work here, It will continue until he comes again. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention recently to the number of sort of high-profile converts to Christianity there have been, sort of in the media and the news outlets, you know, former atheists who become Christians and sort of high profile. I'm um, thinking, um, you know, there's a, there was a Muslim scholar named uh, Hershey, uh, uh, Ayan Hershey Ali, who's recently become a believer. Um, there's the author and historian Tom Holland of the Dominion fame. I commend the book to you, or the Rubicon. He's a, he's a uh, sort of a historian, Western civilization. He has become a believer. And most recently, the actor, at least to my way of thinking, the, uh, the actor and comedian Russell Brand, um, has become a, has a, had a major and very public um, conversion to Christianity. Uh, just last night, Liza and I were watching an interview he did um, uh, with Tucker Carlson. Now, now politics aside, you know I don't know what people were expecting to hear when they went to a a um, a, a, a show or, or an event that was branded as uh, that was um, advertised as Tucker Carlson interviews Russell Brand. I don't know what they were expecting to hear, but I know what they heard was a 90-minute sermon a 90-minute confession about what the Lord has done in Russell's life to save him from his own attestation, a life of meaningless pursuit of wealth and power. In his own words, a life of bowing down to false idols. It's quite moving to watch, really. And I pray for him and all other, particularly public Christians, they're in very prominent positions, that the Lord would hold them fast to their convictions and their confessions. But it was very encouraged at the same time. You know, as, as Martin Luther, as, uh, Martin Luther, uh, Mark Twain said, you know, the death of the church has been highly exaggerated. That's a paraphrase. You know, that there are people that are being saved. There are preachers that are converting, watching uh, the, the, the harvest be brought in, that there is power in the proclamation of what God has done for sinners to save. And we are watching this take place all around us. What's notable about Russell's stated conversion, and very comforting, in fact, is how consistent it is with the biblical description of how salvation comes, namely, through conviction of sin and then the absolution found through the Holy Spirit. This is the pattern, is that people come to an awareness of their need, of their sinfulness, of the, of the, the, the broken and depravity of their human heart, and they find salvation through absolution and forgiveness in Christ, and nothing is ever again the same. And so he confessed how he had been cut to the heart by his sins and has found redemption and release in Jesus, and how that has completely renovated his life. Well, this is a renovation that is, humanly speaking, impossible to produce. However, the church has been given the means of grace. We have been given the word of the cross, And our work here, as Jude the Apostle says, is to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. That's not for our benefit alone, but for the sake of the lost, the hurting, the spiritually deaf and blind. You see, what we're inviting people into here is the fellowship of of communion, I mean, the, the, the communion of forgiven sinners. We are simply those people who are walking, as is everyone, through the valley of the shadow of death, yet without fear. We are the sufferers who have found hope in the midst of pain and confidence in the face of death. 
And now we see, with eyes open and unstopped ears, the promises of our God. And this is, has always been the pattern. Take First Peter, for instance. Peter, writing to his church, under, uh, uh, um, was, was being uh, persecuted, and the people were, one imagines, suffering deeply. What does he write? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This is the Apostle Peter knowing what his people are going through and yet confident that God, by the power of the Spirit, will continue to hold them fast. A little while later in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says this, Be prepared with a ready defense for the hope that you have within you. And notice that that is a, that is a, a re- reflective posture. That means that there would be someone in your life who looked at you and says, How can you walk through what you are going through with that amount of hope? How can you face that situation that you are facing without being brought to your knees in despair? How is it that you have the joy to go on and persevere? That is the the life of faith that will be an attractant, um, will be a, 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 a clarion call to an unbelieving, lost, and hurting world. Now, I'm saying all this, and some of you may be saying, well, that sounds great, but you don't know my life. I barely made it here today, and even now, I'm wondering why I came. (laughs) Some of you, some of you, when thinking about the unbelievers in your life, are cut to the heart. You want nothing more than to see their ears unstopped and eyes open. And some of you are in a a wonderful place right now. It's never better. Some of you, not so great. But wherever you are today, listen to the few verses that preceded our reading from Isaiah. It says this, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, and say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. See, Isaiah writes, Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. You see, this is the promise of God for his people. But notice that it presupposes weakness and frailty and need, which is what we bring to him each and every week, each and every day, each and every hour. And in that weakness, his power is made manifest, and we trust once again that he will, in fact, prove mighty to save. You see, it's highlighted to me when I'm sitting in a hospital chapel um, that this sort of that that these are places of suffering and death, but they're not the only place. I mean, phone calls can come at any time. You know, news of a diagnosis or a loss is right around the corner in all of our lives, and we are aware of this. And I often think, in light of that, about how people go through life without the hope of resurrection. How do people live in this world knowing these contingencies that are out there and the eventuality that will certainly befall them? How do they face the challenge of life without the hope that Jesus has brought the world? When I think of these people, living in a world where sin, death, and the devil seem to have been often victorious. And I think about them, and I'm reminded that their problem is blindness to God and deafness to His Word. Well, then I pray. I pray, and I go to the only one who laid down His life for them. We go to the God, as we pray, whose character is always to have mercy, and we intercede on their behalf in the name of Jesus. This is what we do, because Jesus is the one who opens the eyes, unstops the ears, 
and is the one who is mighty to save. So as you leave here today, you consider all this about which we've been speaking, cry out to Jesus for him to intervene in the lives of those whom you love. And when you cry out to him, then pray for the courage to testify to these people, to witness to them of what he has done to save you, to preach to them as you are able. Preach the bad news of sin and the good news of Jesus. Confess with the church that forgiveness is available to all, even the most notorious sinners, and point them to the fact that the ground at the foot of the cross is level and that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thanks be to God. Amen.